Hello, I'm Tucson Weekly senior writer Jim Ninsel, and this is Zona Politics. We begin today with Senator Bernie Sanders. Last weekend, Senator Sanders visited Phoenix and delivered a speech to the largest crowd he's drawn yet in his quest for the presidency. But before the speech, Sanders addressed attendees of the Netroots Nation Conference, a gathering of lefty bloggers, activists, politicians, and strategists. Sanders had agreed to attend a presidential town hall and have a conversation with journalist Jose Antonio Vargas, but the interview was disrupted by activists with the Black Lives Matter movement. We're bringing you some highlights from that conversation in front of a sometimes very testy crowd. We live in a nation in which, to a significant degree, media is controlled by large multinational corporations. We live in a nation in which 95% of talk radio is right-wing, including in areas where Republicans have almost no support. We live in a nation in which conservative Republicans own their own television network. And that is why the work that many of you do in terms of blogging and on the internet is extraordinarily important because you are presenting an analysis of what goes on in America and a vision of where we should go that corporate media does not present. And I thank you very much for that. The other point that I want to make, if some of you have come here to say, wow, we are courageous and we're really on the fringe and we're leading all this stuff, I want to give you some bad news and some good news. The good news is that what most of us believe is exactly what the vast majority of the American people believe. Some of us for years have fought to raise the minimum wage. Some of us believe it should go to 15 bucks an hour. The issue that we're talking about is that we live in a nation which has more wealth and income inequality than any major nation on earth and worse than since 1928. And maybe it's time we did something about it. Yes. We are living in a nation in which the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. Maybe we did something about that. Maybe it is time to have a government which represents ordinary Americans and not just powerful and wealthy campaign contributors. And maybe that is why, maybe that is why it is time to overturn Citizens United and move to public funding of elections. I have not made many promises during this campaign, but here's one I will repeat to you, that any nominee I make to the Supreme Court will have to pass a litmus test, and that litmus test is overturn Citizens United, restore democracy to America. When we talk about issues like Black Lives Matter, let me tell you something. A study just came out a few weeks ago talking about youth unemployment in America, an issue we do not deal with as a nation. And here's what, here's what that report said. What that report said is that if you are a high school graduate and you're white, the unemployment rate is 33%. If you are Hispanic, the unemployment rate is 36%. If you are African American, the unemployment rate is 51%. And in my view, maybe, just maybe, it is time to invest in jobs and education, not in jails and incarceration.
you, you talk a lot about economic inequality, right? Yep, I do. But hearing what's happening here, clearly in this country, we have not fully confronted the racist systems and institutions, right, that coupled with economic inequality is getting us to the place that we're at. How do we do that better? How do we talk about this in such a way? Because well, it's not a talk question of talking about it, it's a question of doing something. Well, yes, but what specific proposals? Well, specific proposals. You, you talk about minimum wage, you talk about minimum wage. Well, specific proposals are for a start, you create an economy where people have decent jobs at decent wages. And that's why we are talking about a trillion dollar program to create 13 million jobs rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. That's number one. Okay. Number two, when you talk about the criminal justice system, we need fundamental reform in police departments all over this country. I was the mayor of the city of Burlington. And what we moved toward was community policing, where police officers are part of the community and not seen as an oppressive force. Mm -hmm. And we've got to do that as well. So I have, I have read about, you know, you, you said that you've been fighting for civil rights, you were there in the march to Washington. Can you point to any legislation in the past 10 years that you've supported um, that have benefited the African American community and communities of color in this country? Sure. Many. Can, can you name a couple? Well, yeah. We, we built, um, in, in the Affordable Care Act, which is providing uh, health insurance to many millions of Americans, uh, we got a provision in there, a $12 billion provision, which expanded community health centers all over America, hundreds of new community health centers, most of them, or many of them, in low-income and minority communities. That means that millions of people who otherwise would not have been able to access health care are now getting health care, dental care, mental health counseling, and low-cost prescription drugs. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, let, me, let me pivot a little bit to immigration. There's a headline on CNN a couple of weeks ago that said, headline, where Bernie Sanders disappoint. It's on immigration. And the article talked about the fact that you voted against a bipartisan immigration bill sponsored by McCain and Kennedy in 2007, and for an immigration, for an immigration bill in 2013, but expressed concerns about it even right. though you ultimately supported Absolutely. it. So here's my question, right? You said you were worried about protecting jobs, with labor unions being a major part of your base. How do you reconcile being pro-labor and being pro-immigration reform? Easy. I voted against, when you talk about immigration, I want to ask you a question. Why is it the Chamber of Commerce and all of the big money organizations love the immigration bill? Do you think they're staying up nights worrying about undocumented workers in this country? Why? You tell me. Um, you know I'm, why? I'm not running for president, but go ahead. You I will can, tell you, you, you why. Can, you can. I will tell you why. Okay. Because this bill has two major components. Number one, the good thing it has, it says that we're going to take 11 million people out of the shadows and give them dignity mm -hmm. and give them a path yes. to citizenship. Yes, that's yes. the good part. That's the good part, yes. And that's what I strongly support. You know what the not so good part is? That at a time when we have millions of kids in this country who can't find the job, what the Chamber of Commerce, the big money interests want is to be able to bring into this country mm -hmm. on guest worker programs low wage workers who will be competing against kids in this country who desperately need jobs. They're going to bring H-1B professional workers into this country to lower wages for our high tech workers. Frankly, I don't think that's a good idea. The reason, let me, let me answer. No, go ahead, go ahead. The reason I voted. Hold on, hold on. The reason I voted for the last bill is I got language in for a billion and a half dollars to create many, many jobs for kids in this country. And that was important to me. So we, to my view is, of course, we need a path towards citizenship for undocumented workers. Of course, we should not be dividing up families. Of course, I support the DREAM Act. But I do worry that corporate America and the big money interests, of course, want to bring cheap labor into this country in guest worker programs and continue the race to the bottom, something which is devastating to this country and forcing millions of people in this country to work longer hours for lower wages. Well, but, but looking at that 2013 immigration bill, there's no such a thing as a perfect legislation. But right. for me, looking at that, you're looking at it, you're going, 
do we want to spend any more billions of dollars securing a border that will never really be secure? Like we have spent in this country since nine. your point, I should not have voted for the well, bill. Well, my point is, as president, as president, when you hear no. Congress talk about we need to secure the border, we need to secure, we have spent a hundred billion dollars since 9/11 no, securing this border. Yeah. What would you say to that? Well, my answer is that to get in fan, I didn't help write this bill. Yeah. I voted for it. You vote, yes, but I understand. the people that. who ended up putting together a bipartisan bill, including uh, working with some uh, conservative Republicans, that was their insistence. Okay, not my insistence, that was their insistence. And if you wanted a bill, and by the way, what is very one of the fault lines of that bill is it ties the path to citizenship with the border. And I think that that does not make a whole lot of sense. But that is the bipartisan bill that mm -hmm. was passed. In retrospect, would you have supported it? I did support it. No, would you support it again? If, if knowing what we know now, talking yeah. about border security and all of that, would, would you have supported it? Yeah, I think you've got 11 million people in this country who are living in the shadows, who are fearful legitimately of being deported, of families being broken up. This is a, not a particularly good bill. But I think yeah, that issue good. is so important that we give some legal protection to 11 million people who are living in enormous anxiety. Yeah, I would. Okay. Well, and, you know, that's fine. You, you may, we may want in this room what we want, but you got a United States Congress, which gets back to my first point. If you want a Congress that begins to address the needs of the American people, we got a lot of work to do. This Congress does not do that. Senator Sanders, Senator Sanders, do you support, if you were elected president, you're looking at Congress, it's doing nothing on immigration. President Obama's executive actions are stuck in the courts. Would you take executive action as well? Absolutely. No, I support what the president has done and probably would go further. But executive actions, executive actions are not legislation. And the answer is that you have a Congress right now, and I hope everybody understands it, that you have a Republican Party completely owned by big money interests, and too many Democrats are sympathetic to corporate interests. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. And nothing is going to change until you change that, which is what a political revolution is So this is, is tied to economic equality, college, uh, co college costs in this country. Yes. Governor Mali has embraced debt-free college. Do you support debt-free college, including cost beyond tuition? I have gone further than that. Uh, if you look at, well, without going into the governor's position, this is my view. We introduced, do I support it? I've introduced the legislation. This is what the legislation would do. At a time when we have hundreds of thousands of bright, capable young people who can't go to college for one reason, and that's because their families don't have the income to send them to college, that's pretty crazy stuff. And that is why I've introduced legislation that does two things. Number one, it says that all public colleges and universities in America will be tuition free. Number two, number two, what I have said, which is equally important, is that we have in this country millions of people, including, I expect, people in this room who have very, very high college debts. Is that correct? All right. And here is the insanity of that. We have people who are paying interest rates on their college debts of 8, 9, 10% at the time when you can refinance your home for 2 or 3%. So what we are saying in our legislation is that people with college debt should be able to refinance, substantially lowering their interest rates. Zona Politics will be right back with Attorney Jeff Rogers and Republican National Committeeman Bruce Ash to talk about Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, and a whole bunch more. Support comes from the Arizona Inn, a Ford Diamond family-owned historic resort hotel and restaurant on Elm Street near the U of A. Information is at ArizonaInn.com. Zona Politics is made possible by the generous support of Hotel Congress, the epicenter of downtown dining, music, and culture. Experience the hotel that the Washington Post called the crown jewel of Congress Street. More information available at hotelcongress.com. 
Zona Politics is a proud media partner of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which serves the business community in the bilingual, bicultural region of the Arizona Sonora border. For more information, visit TucsonHispanicChamber.org or call 620-0005. Joining me now to talk about the presidential race and much more, Bruce Ash, the National Republican Committeeman from Arizona, and Attorney Jeff Rogers, the former chair of the Pima County Democratic Party. Welcome both of you to Zona Politics. Thanks. Jeff, let's talk about Bernie Sanders. He drew this huge crowd in Phoenix, a lot of energy and enthusiasm in the room. I was there for the speech. Why, why do you think he's taking off among the liberal Democrats? Well, I, I think he, he there's, there's a lot of economic populism out there right now, uh, people who feel left out, a lot of income inequality arguments, and, and he appeals to that same group of people that, that, that years ago uh, 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 w w was supporting a, a former chair of the Democratic Party, Dean. Um, so there are, are a lot of people out there who kind of think that Hillary's a little too mainstream, maybe she's a little uh, uh, more more conservative than, than the base of the Democratic Party. So I think he's appealing to that segment. I don't think he realistically has a shot at the nomination, but um, he certainly energized one, you know, some of the more liberal element of the Democratic Party. What's your take on what's going on with Bernie Sanders, Bruce? He's exciting the left. He's driving the agenda of the Democratic Party to the left. Uh, Hillary Clinton is forced to respond uh, in that fashion. There are several um, key issues that uh, she has failed to um, comment on. Uh, for example, the Planned Parenthood uh, problem with uh, selling um, uh, baby parts uh, to the highest bidder. Uh, she's refused to make any kind of a comment on that. Uh, Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley will continue to move the agenda uh, of the Democratic Party to the left. And, and really, that's what's left in Congress, are all the lefties who uh, you were in safe districts and it was impossible to defeat them. Well, first off, uh, Planned Parenthood is not selling body parts in any way, shape, or form. That is absolutely illegal under federal law. Um, people are allowed to donate tissue uh, and, and some forms of Planned Parenthood in various other states, not Arizona, do allow such donation. And then the compensation is basically kind of like a, you go to a blood bank and you donate blood. Sort of like somebody's got to take your, uh, your blood. Some, so they've got to pay the salaries of the people who take your blood. They've got to store the blood. They've got their costs associated with, 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 with taking that blood to hospitals. And it's the same for this fetal tissue. And not only does Planned Parenthood do that, but this is common amongst university research institutions, uh, although I don't think there's any of it being done in Arizona. So there is no actual sale of this stuff, no profits. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, and, and what they did was they took a two-hour video, edited it down to nine minutes, to, to, and, and tried to make it look like there was something clandestine going on. When in reality, once people saw the full videos of both of these videos, you could see that this, these right-wing fanatics who, are, who want to end women's reproductive rights uh, uh, to choice, uh, that they, what they've done is they've, they've engaged in a three-year campaign to, to torment Planned Parenthood and its affiliates across America. It's absolutely ridiculous to say they're selling by baby parts or tissue of any kind. Well, and you they know certainly that were, and, and there were certainly no. They certainly were not. Made. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. That's a, I'm a completely false claim, and I'm I'm shocked to hear someone like you to would even make such a claim. I don't I, I don't uh, uh, I'm not surprised that this that, that these fanatics are making such claims, but I'm sort of shocked to hear you make that kind of a claim. Well, I, I think Americans are judging for themselves. This is a, a grotesque. Uh, exhibit of what happens sometimes. Uh, this certainly doesn't happen at all Planned Parenthood. It doesn't uh, happen affiliates. at any Planned Parenthood. Uh, it, it happened here and there and there was an open negotiation. It did not happen here. Parts. It did not happen here. It does not happen anywhere in Arizona. Arizona's version of Planned Parenthood doesn't I even here in Arizona. I said that particular uh, videotape showed evidence. It did not show evidence of any such thing, Bruce. Okay. That's absolutely ridiculous. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad that you feel compelled to defend yourself and, and the movement. Uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, I think, is living on borrowed time in terms of federal I, I hardly, I hardly think so. And, and Planned Parenthood, the, any federal appropriations that they receive goes merely for birth control and other women's health activities. It is absolutely against the law for Planned Parenthood to use any of funds that come from a federal or state source All for any abortion fungible. activities. I, I want to go, go back to Bernie Sanders here, which it was the, earlier in the day at Netroots, uh, he had a bit of a harder time uh, when, when his uh, talk was disrupted 
by uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters. And uh, there were people in the room uh, who I spoke to who, who seemed to think that uh, Bernie may have some trouble with African American groups, with other minority groups. Uh, Nate Silver has some polling data about how Sanders is favored by white liberals, but not by other groups in the Democratic Party. Jeff, your, your thoughts on that? I, I saw that Nate Silver column on that, and I, I think there's some truth to that, that he, you know, he, he lives in what is, uh, was described by Nate Silver as the whitest state in America, Vermont, which is something like 97 percent white. Um, I didn't realize that it was, but I, I assume he's correct in his figures. But, you know, so he's never really had to deal with African Americans. And so, you know, and this is a big issue. I mean, with the shootings we've seen all across America and some of the the, 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 you know, kind of discrimination that we still see against African Americans in this day and age, it's become a big issue in the Democratic Party. And uh, I, I think he's probably someone who right now is ill-prepared to deal with that, as we saw in, in, in the video from that, the Netroots Nation. And Martin O'Malley was attacked as well yes. uh, for claiming that all lives matter. And, and I agree with Martin O'Malley. I agree uh, with Senator Sanders. All lives matter. And, and, and we obviously are never going to be a nation that is uh, fully ridded of um, the, the, the dangerous germs of, of discrimination. Uh, but to contend that only black lives matter and anybody who disagrees with that is somehow um, uh, not right and, and not politically correct. And for Martin O'Malley to feel compelled to apologize for saying that all lives matter it really makes me question his, his uh, um, commitment to serving all Americans if he's elected president. But, but I, I do admire both him and Senator Sanders for saying that all lives matter because they do. Well, certainly all, all lives do matter, but there, you know, we, we've seen African Americans treated uh, poorly for, for centuries in this country, and, uh, and it still goes on to this day. And so it, it's, it certainly ought to be a focus of Democrats, Republicans, and everyone to say, yeah, all lives matter, but you know, these people should not be discriminated against in any way, shape, or form. Let me uh, shift over to what's going on with Donald Trump. He's had this feud going with John McCain. This week he gave out Lindsey Graham's cell phone number. Uh, he's rocketed to the top of the polls. Uh, and Bruce, your thoughts on, on this whole Trump phenomenon? Um, Donald Trump is, is an interesting guy. He's a longtime self-promoter, uh, sort of cult personality, uh, presidential campaigns, uh, both the primaries as well as the general campaigns have become somewhat of a, of a cultural uh, contest. Uh, Trump is the flavor of the month. Um, whether the comments that he made about uh, John McCain um, begin a, a slow shift downward, we'll not know. Uh, we have the first debate, which will take place in Cleveland uh, the first week of August. Um, that'll be a very interesting place where these 10 candidates stand up together and, and have an opportunity to air things out. And by the way, uh, the other good news is the other candidates who don't necessarily make the, this uh, sort of complicated uh, um, formula for Fox picking the 10 uh, people up on the stage, they also have a C-SPAN uh, forum uh, that they'll be participating in as well. So it, all, all the Republican voices are going to be heard. I'm glad that there's a, a large contest uh, that's going on in the Republican Party. I'm hoping that the Democratic Party will engage in the same sort of a debate, uh, a constructive debate, not calling people dummies and losers and you know wishing that somebody had not been captured and so on. Th these are message fragments and, and they, they make great news and, and they're kind of entertaining, but we're not any closer to really knowing what our presidential candidate uh, is going to look like uh, from from today in in July, uh, 2015. Your thoughts on on Don the Donald? The Donald. I, well, Democrats are loving watching it. I mean, he's becoming the face of the Republican Party in some respects. I, I think it's very fascinating to see how when he slurred John McCain's uh, uh, heroic military experience, every other. Republican candidate jumped on him immediately about that, but not one of them has said anything about how he slurred the, the, the country of Mexico uh, and Mexican uh, American immigrants. Uh, you know, he slurred a whole class the of people, the jumped on and, the and, and, and we haven't heard any of these candidates really speak out against him. Now, the RNC did say something about it, but, but the rest of the candidates, you know, so he's kind of, be, and I, what that tells me is that they don't disagree with his, his characterization of immigration issues in this country. And I think uh, it's certainly in the long term, and I think even in this election, the 
Republican Party's uh, uh, immigration stance is going to hurt them at the polls in, in the next election. So Bruce, you got John Kasich joining the presidential race this week. Uh, 16 candidates now, Who, who's the top tier? Probably uh, besides Donald Trump, who's the flavor of the month uh, at this time, um, you would have uh, Jeb Bush, Scott Walker, uh, Marco Rubio. Uh, I like Carly Fiorina as well in that mix. Uh, she's very, very bright. She's articulate. She's uh, exciting crowds wherever she goes. Uh, and she's a real fighter. Uh, she'll be great on the campaign trail. Um, we have great candidates. I mean, there's no lack of successful Republican governors uh, who are involved in this. And we have some people who've been battle tested, uh, whether it's in 2008 or, or 2012. Uh, with Governor Huckabee, uh, Senator Santorum, and so on. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, race. Uh, we're, we'll, we'll probably start seeing some of the ranks thin, thin out some uh, here in the fall. Uh, and certainly, uh, if there's a problem for any of these candidates, it's going to come uh, in the four early carve-out states. By the, by the end of February, we're going to know pretty much who the top tier of the top tier is. Mm. Definitely. Well, I, I, one he person he didn't mention was Ted Cruz, who's raised the uh, second most amount of money to uh, Jeb Bush. So you know, it, it, uh, he, he probably probably rounds that out. But it's a uh, uh, I, I'm enjoying watching the Republican primaries as, uh, as they sort it out. I enjoyed it last time around too. I thought that uh, ultimately the, the same thing is going to happen. They're gonna, the candidate that emerges is going to be so badly damaged from having to uh, uh, go so far and so extreme to the right on issues like immigration and other issues that, that, that whoever emerges is going to be so badly damaged that we, the Democrats should have a very good chance of winning. On the Democratic side, you know, I, I, it's interesting to see Sanders shaking things up a little bit. I think uh, it's healthy for Hillary to have a good, uh, um, some good opponents. Um, I do think she's going to emerge uh, victorious by a wide margin, but uh, I think it's, it's good for us to have a little bit of a contest and it's good to, for us to talk about the issues. And as crowded the field is, any chance of a brokered convention, Bruce? Doubt it. I, I doubt it. You, you'll have it resolved uh, through the, I think, the primary I think process. It'll, I think it'll be resolved through the contest. Uh, I think the course that we've taken uh, party rules uh, over the past uh, couple of years is going to help us. Uh, we're going to have all of our states fully represented uh, in this particular uh, primary season. Uh, and uh, we've, we've set out uh, a debate uh, schedule that I think is going to give America a great chance uh, to, to see our candidates and, and to know what they believe in. Uh, let, let me ask you this. What do you think of the Iran deal? It's a bad deal. Because? Uh, lack of uh, verification. Um, there, um, uh, there, there is uh, um, a real problem with uh, the economic aid. Uh, as well as the ending of sanctions uh, on Iran. Um, there'll practically be no way of taking out uh, an Iranian nuclear development uh, facility uh, with the uh, aid that they're going to get and the um, sanctions on other countries uh, who, if they even employ sabotage, uh, are in trouble uh, with the United Nations. Uh, it's a bad deal. We, we operated from a position of uh, of, of weakness. Uh, the Clinton-Obama carry deal is, I think, going to go down uh, as, as one of the po most poorly conceived peace uh, deals uh, around. Uh, Egypt wants nuclear weapons. Saudi Arabia wants nuclear weapons. Uh, we're going to find great proliferation of nuclear weapons all through that region. Jeff, your thoughts? And we've well, got about a minute left. We, 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 had, we had a choice between basically declaring war on Iran or coming to an agreement. And this agreement um, has been endorsed by the United Nations Security Council unanimously. Uh, the five permanent members plus Germany were the, the people negotiating this in addition to the United States. And uh, so, you know, this is a pretty good deal. It's, uh, it, it, it should shut down their uranium enrichment process for 10 to 15 years. Now, do I trust Iran? No. Do I think they might cheat on it? I think they might. But the fact is, is that this deal has uh, verification implements in it that, that allow us to snap back the sanctions rapidly should they, should they renege on the deal or cheat. So I think it's probably best under the circumstances. Certainly Americans aren't ready to, to attack Iran and have another war. It's not this or war, Jeff. And, and, I think it is. And, and, and we're and dealing I, with a belligerent nation. And, and, and I agree with you. They're a very belligerent nation. And, but but there, it is either this or war. And uh, and, and, and I don't think and I don't think and case. I don't think it's in Israel's interest or in the United States' interest to be attacking Iran at this point in time. Now, some point in time in the future, attacking. it might be necessary to destroy the some only facilities. One, the only one who is saying they want to attack is Iran, and they still wish 
this is okay, Israel's goal. We, 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 we got to leave it there. I want to thank both Bruce Ash and, and Jeff Rogers for coming by today. Uh, that is our show. Next week, we'll have Elizabeth Warren and Martin O'Malley from the Netroots Conference. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors at the Arizona Inn and at Hotel Congress. We'll see you next time. Support comes from Brink Media, Arizona's most politically aware creative agency. Buy our vote at brink.com. Support for this program generously provided by Charles A. Levy.